Hi everyone, welcome to Unit 5, Chapter 4, where we will be discussing Kingdom Animalia and all the diversity within um, the nine major phyla of Kingdom Animalia. So, what does it mean to be part of the animal kingdom? Well, the animal kingdom is incredibly diverse. Of course, we have chordates like the mouse and even giant animals like the great blue whale. But we also have very small organisms like flukes and worms, as well as the sea sponge. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't know that the sea sponge was actually classified as an animal. So let's talk about why the sea sponge is an animal. Well, to be an animal, you have to be multicellular, and sea sponges are multicellular. Sometimes they're considered colonial, but they do have specific cells which do specific jobs. While they don't have particularly a complex tissue structure, they do have those dedicated cells which act as tissues. Now, sea sponges are filter feeders, which means they are heterotrophic. Heterotrophy means that they have to consume organic material in order to get energy or nutrients. Um, they do not actively move as adults, and I don't think that anybody would assume that a sea sponge does move. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily fulfill this requirement, but in their life cycle, the larvae are free swimming, so the larvae are motile. Now, other organisms like higher orders of kingdom animalia do have very complex and sometimes even very rapid movement, such as this bumblebee, which can fly very quickly. So we are going to cover all nine major phyla listed here um, as we continue through. Now, there are some other features within the animal kingdom that primarily have to do with their reproduction and development. Most animals are diploid as an adult. Now, there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about those exceptions next. But remember, a diploid means that you're going to get one copy of your genes from mom and one copy of genes from your dad. So you're going to have two copies of the same genes, but they may be slightly different variations. That means that the gametes, or the egg and sperm, are going to be haploid. Remember when an egg joins a sperm, they come together in a fertilization event to produce a zygote. After karyogamy, which just means the nucleus is fused, uh, we have a diploid zygote, which has the potential to become the full-grown adult of that organism's species. Um, now, when this zygote starts to develop, it will go through specific stages, and we're going to talk about those specific stages, um, which are going to be related to the species that we're speaking about. For instance, this butterfly here goes through several specific stages once it is hatched. The um, the larvae here looks very different from the pupa, which looks very different from the adult. Whereas something that goes through incomplete metamorphosis, the nymph here, the baby, looks almost exactly like a miniature version of the adult. These organisms also will have a fixed body plan. So there will be specific developmental cues that develop certain features of this organism. Now let's talk about some of those exceptions. Um, some animals have an asexual life cycle, meaning they can reproduce sexually, but they also have an asexual stage or an asexual option. For instance, if mates are not regularly available, they can reproduce asexually. Or in the case of the brittle sea star right here, if a piece of it broke off, it can not only go through regeneration creating a whole of itself, but the broken off piece can regenerate into an exact clone. So uh, fragmentation will produce an exact clone. 
This is uh, very common with uh, planaria or flatworms. If you cut them and cut them in half and cut them in half again, in fact, if you put this guy inside of a blender, you're going to end up with a lot of clones. As long as a single cell from the planaria survives, that single cell can regenerate uh, into a full clone. Um, hydras and sea anemones go through another uh, phenomenon called budding, which means that they can grow like a branch off of their edge, which will then break off and become a whole clone. The other version of um, reproduction that animals can do is called parthenogenesis. Now, parthenogenesis is very unique because parthenogenesis is usually used as a backup um, during times of stress when there's no mate available. Now, um, parthenogenesis, as opposed to sexual reproduction, where we have a haploid gamete bind with a haploid gamete to produce a diploid zygote, parthenogenesis does not need to be fertilized, which means this creature is able to have a haploid adult. This oocyte or the egg will just develop into an adult, but this adult will be haploid, which means they will be sterile. There are diploid parthenogenesis though. There's something called automixes, auto meaning self. So the female or the oocyte in the female can bind with another oocyte in the female, growing into a diploid zygote that has the potential to become a full-grown adult. But if I do a genetic test on that individual and the offspring that was developed through parthenogenesis, it will be genetically unique, but it will be more like a sister than an offspring because there's no new genes coming into this gene pool. In that way, it wouldn't be practical for, say, humans to undergo parthenogenesis because you would end up with too many mutations or inbreeding. Now, another version of automixes is when this just kind of like duplicates itself, the genes duplicate itself, and then that diploid offspring uh, or that diploid egg will become the zygote. So automixes means that we're going to self-fertilize. Apomixes, in science, A usually means not. Um, they do not undergo meiosis. Meiosis, remember, is the process of creating genetically unique uh, uh, sperm and egg or gametes. So apomixes only goes through mitosis and does not go through the meiosis process. So it creates an egg that actually is uh, very similar to the parent. And then that diploid egg will grow into a diploid individual that is very similar, if not exactly the same as the parent. Um, so parthenogenesis is very interesting. One thing that I find to be very interesting is that some of these organisms use parthenogenesis as a backup plan. Uh, for instance, in these crickets, there are sister species. These two species are almost exactly alike, but this species branched off and is able to undergo parthenogenesis. So in times of stress, this one would be more resilient. They don't use this as their main mode of reproduction, though. Whereas bees will use parthenogenesis as their main mode of reproduction because, remember, the only um, organism allowed to reproduce in a beehive is the queen bee. So when the queen bee mates with a male, she undergoes fertilization just like normal and will produce other queen bees. This doesn't happen very often though. Most of the time, the queen is um, just in the hive producing eggs over and over and over again. And those eggs will be haploid sterile individuals that become the worker bees and the drones. Um, so interesting enough, actually some vertebrates are able to do this, like snakes and lizards. Uh, reptiles are able to do this, but not all species of reptiles. It is much more common in insects, but again, not all species of insect. So what happens after the haploid sperm joins the haploid egg? Well, we get a diploid zygote almost immediately that zygote will start to divide in half 
in half again, and in half until we reach this eight cell stage. We still consider this a zygote, we still call it a zygote, but as it continues to divide and divide and divide, the cells become more specialized. Whereas here, they're still stem cells. Each of these cells could become any part of the body. Once we get to this hollow blastula, then we have more cell specialization. So as we continue to, to divide and grow, we create this hollow area or the blastocell, this hollow area. Pretty soon as it continues to divide, the edges will start to dip in in one area. We call this the blastopore. This blastopore will eventually become the digestive tract, which means we now have cells along the outside of the animal and we have cells along the inside of the animal. The cells along the outside are aptly named ectoderm or the der germ layer outside of the cell. Then the inside layer is going to be called endoderm or the germ layer that's inside of the cell. Now, some animals, in fact, most higher order animals also fill in the gaps. This empty space also gets filled with cells called the mesoderm or the middle germ layer. Um, as these animals continue to grow, some of the higher order animals will exhibit bilateral symmetry, meaning I could divide them in half down the middle and end up with two relatively similar sides. Um, whereas some other animals exhibit radial symmetry, like the nelt in a nadaria jellyfish or the sea anemone, which is also a nadarian. Um, these have radial symmetry, which means I could cut them in any direction, kind of like a cake, and end up with equal parts. Now, lower order animals or parazoa do not have true symmetry. And the example here is phylum porifera or these sea sponges, because it doesn't matter how I cut this, it's never going to be symmetrical. Now, why am I mentioning symmetry? Well, it has to do with that gastrula there. Um, remember, the gastrula has this blastopore in the front. If the animal exhibits a radial symmetry, it probably only has two layers, the ectoderm and endoderm. But if the animal exhibits bilateral symmetry, it is going to be triploblastic. Remember, di means two. Tri means three. So we're going to have three germ layers, the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. The mesoderm will start to form inside of this empty space. Um, and depending on the animal that we're talking about, it will form in different ways. Here you can see a different picture um, where we can see these different layers. We have the ectoderm and the endoderm triploblast will also have a mesoderm, whereas diploblast will have nothing in this space or a non-living layer. Now, what is the significance of these germ layers? Well, endo, meaning inside, will form the inner lining of the digestive tract and inner organs like the trachea and lungs. Ecto means outside. This is, of course, going to include your skin, but interestingly enough, this also includes the central nervous system. This is because the endoderm starts to produce a fold on the um, dorsal side of the animal, and as the skin fold um, closes, it produces this empty tube, which will eventually in higher order animals become the vertebra or the uh, neural tube, the spinal cord. Now, what about mesoderm? Meso means middle, and this is everything else. This is going to be your muscle, bone, cartilage, blood, and organs that are not part of the digestive tract or lungs or the central nervous system. So everything else gets shoved into the mesoderm. Um, now, let's go back to that blastopore, that interesting blastopore. We said that that was going to be the beginning of the digestive tract. Well, some animals are called protostomes. Proto meaning the first, like a prototype. This means they produce their mouth first. This opening will become a mouth. 
Um, as this uh, becomes longer and completes the digestive system, the second opening will become the anus. Well, what about deuterostomes? This is going to be mouth second. So the blastopore is actually the anus and the second opening becomes the mouth. Sorry, that didn't go well. I didn't circle it correctly. So if you would take a gander, do you think that we are protostomes or deuterostomes? Actually, humans are deuterostomes. And in fact, most higher order uh, animals are. All vertebrates are going to be deuterostomes. All right, let's talk about those layers. Now, inside of those layers, there can be some space or a gap. This gap is called a column and is considered a body cavity. Now, different organisms can use these body cavities in different ways. Humans have a body cavity that helps to reduce friction inside of our organs. Um, we line them uh, with lining and have fluid inside of these columns to allow cushioning for our organs. Other animals can actually fill them with fluid at will and use them kind of like a hydrostatic skeleton or um, movement. So animals use this in different ways. There are three different classifications for the body cavity. The first one is A. Remember, A normally means not. So these organisms, like this flatworm, have no column. Remember, we do still have all three germ layers in these uh, um, flatworms, but there's no body cavity. And then we have the word pseudo. Pseudo usually means fake or false. So when I'm looking at this roundworm, the nematode, it has a very large body cavity. This body cavity is in between the mesoderm and the endoderm. So there's a gap in between the body of the organism and its digestive tract. This is usually called a tube within a tube, um, and it can still act as a hydrostatic skeleton. But this tube within a tube feature um, is something that nematodes have. Then we have eucolomates. Usually this means true. So these are your true colomates. Our example here is a segmented worm, but higher order animals are also eucolomates. They have a true colum. It is not a tube within a tube. And the colum only touches the mesoderm. So it's sandwiched inside of the mesoderm. It does not touch the endoderm at all. So this is your true body cavity. Um, and it can help with motion, especially in these segmented worms. Now, we are going to go over examples of each of the nine major phyla. I like this picture because you can really see how related these animals are based on their features. For instance, bilateral animals or deuterostomes. Here we are, the chordates. Um, we're not going to go over every single one of these phyla, though. We're only going to go over nine major phyla. And if you were to look at these phyla, which one would you guess is the most diverse, meaning it has the most number of species? Um, of course, we are a little narcissistic and we love uh, ourselves so much. So some people might guess that vertebrates are the most diverse, but that's not actually the case. You might look at the mollusca and think, oh, octopus, squid, snails, and clams, that seems pretty diverse. And in fact, yes, there is a lot of difference between those animals, but it's not the most number of species. The highest number of species is actually arthropods. They have over a million different species, the majority of those being six-legged insects. So if you want to review the nine major phyla, here they are, but you can also click on this link to go to an interactive. This interactive is also available in the lesson um, as a separate link. But if you hover over these animals, you can get information about them, their body symmetry, their reproduction, different features. And then there's a little icon right here. You can click to see the um, nine major phyla highlighted. So all of these are the nine major phyla. And if you hover, you will get a short description. All of this information is testable, but it is not comprehensive of the exam. So let's go over some more detailed information. 
Phylum porifera. Por means whole. So these are poor bearing or holy creatures. Um, imagine your bath sponge. Your bath sponge or your common sponge um, does have a fibrous skeleton made out of spongin fibers. These are very flexible um, uh, fibers that are made. And this makes sense if you think about it because the living cells have to have died, leaving behind only the skeleton. But there are other types of um, sponges that have different types of skeletons, like a silica skeleton. If you remember the diatoms, they have shells made of uh, silica. It's a very glass-like. We also have sea sponges made out of calcium carbonate skeletons, which is actually really common because we have other organisms um, that use calcium carbonate to excrete their shells, like seashells are made out of calcium carbonate. And then the, um, the last class, they do not have a skeleton at all. So what exactly is a um, sea sponge? Well, they don't have a specific body plan. They're asymmetrical, but they do have specific types of cells that help them live and grow. Um, for instance, here are their spiracles, which act as their skeleton. And then the choanocytes act as um, flickering uh, flagella. And when they flick the flagella, it kind of creates a water current and pulls water in from the outside through all of these little pores. Now, in this artist's rendition, this looks like a very symmetrical, very straight line. But in many of these, these are just kind of all crazy. So the water is being pulled in literally through the sponge. While the water is being pulled in through the sponge and spit out through the top, um, they are absorbing oxygen and nutrients literally just through diffusion. So they are very susceptible to the things that are around them in the water. Um, the amoebocytes are known to kind of move around within the animal and deliver nutrients. So I'm think that that's really interesting. They do sexually reproduce and asexually reproduce. When they sexually reproduce, they are going to release tons of sperm just out into the water, and hopefully it lands on another sponge and fertilizes those egg cells. All right, next we will talk about nidaria. The C is a silent, it is nidaria. And it is named after the nidocyte or the stinging cell. All um, species inside kingdom or phylum nidaria have these nidocytes, sometimes called nematocysts. Um, they're very sensitive to touch, and when they're touched, they spring, they have released this spring loaded barb. The spring loaded barb will attach to the uh, prey or whatever it's stinging, and um, sometimes release a uh, toxin or a venom, some sort of stinging fluid. Now, um, nidarias are not complicated creatures, they, own, they do not have a complete digestive system they have something called a gastrovascular cavity. They can um, pump this fluid around to disperse oxygen and nutrients. They do not really have an anus. They have something called a mouth anus. So the food goes in and the waste comes out of the same place. Um, they do not have a brain or a nervous system, but they do have something called a nerve net, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's like a little web of nerves. Now, this does not help it to think, see, find prey or anything. They're literally just floating through the water, hoping to catch a little fish inside of their net of tentacles. What the nerve net does is allow coordination of movement of these flaps so it can kind of float around. Um, so I think that nidarians are very, very interesting. Um, they also have a multi-step life cycle. They can produce sexually and asexually um, through budding but um, their sexual reproductive life cycle goes through distinct stages where they form a polyp. Now, sea anemones and corals live their entire life cycle as a polyp, but the true jellyfish will then grow into an ephytra 
and into their adult form called a medusa. So when you see a jellyfish, this is the medusa. When you see a sea anemone, it's called a polyp. This family includes true jellyfish, sea anemones, and corals, but also the Portuguese man o' war, which actually can inflate its gastrovascular cavities to float along the surface of the water, and box jellyfish. This does not include comb jellyfish. All right, phylum platyhelminth. Um, these are the flatworms, um, and they come in many different shapes and sizes. The free-living flatworms can actually be quite beautiful, uh, and they're usually marine flatworms. Um, but other flatworms include the uh, nematodes, I'm sorry, not the nematodes, the trematodes, which are blood flukes. They're usually parasitic. They can be quite small and the planaria as well. And then we also have tapeworms in this family, uh, the cestoda. So let's talk about the planaria. This is a planaria. They're very, very small. They're kind of like about that big in real life, very small. But some of these flatworms can get very large, like the hammerhead flatworm. Remember, you can't kill these guys by cutting them in half or squishing them. You have to kill them with like fire or acid or they will just grow back. So don't ever touch a hammerhead um, flatworm, please. Now, uh, let's talk about this planaria. The planaria is very interesting. It only has one opening, the mouth anus, so it does not have a complete digestive system, but the mouth anus is attached to this pharynx, which it can actually extend from its body to consume food. Large undigested material will have to come back out of the mouth anus, but nitrogenous waste like urea um, actually goes out the edges because of something called a flame cell. It's called a flame cell because the cilia it just kind of like flicks and flickers, and that helps to draw the waste fluid out and through these tubules to an excretory pore. So it does have an excretory canal, but all of the major large particles will have to come out of the mouth anus. Some other interesting things about it is that it actually has a pretty advanced nervous system. It has two major nerves running the length of the body, and they are connected by these transverse nerves, kind of like a ladder. They do have eye spots. They don't really see the way you and I see, but they are sensitive to light and dark, and they are located on top of these cerebral ganglia. Ganglia is not a brain. It's more of a, con a collection of nerves that work together, um, maybe a brain prototype. Um, this also includes tapeworms. Tapeworms you're usually going to get from eating raw meat. Um, we don't see this very often in humans, but a person who's preparing the meat and maybe doesn't wash their hands thoroughly, they can get some of these organisms underneath their fingernails, and then they eat the food uh, that they prepared and they unintentionally consume um, a small piece of this uh, tapeworm. Now, tapeworms are repeating segments of clones of themselves. They just repeat these same segments over and over and over again. Um, and the top part is actually called a scolex. It's not a head. It's just a modified version of one of these guys here, which also can reproduce. They have eggs in these little sacks right there. Um, but this is just a collection of suckers and hooks that allow it to stay attached to the intestines of the animal uh, that it's a uh, host and it will absorb nutrients from its host animal. So very interesting creatures. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I was gonna ask you about the Caudia symbol. Uh, the Cotica symbol is usually used for uh, medical professionals, and it's hypothesized that this is a representation of one of the very first medical treatments uh, recorded, which is the removal of a guinea worm. The guinea worm is not actually like a worm. It's actually a nematode, a type of parasite. Uh, the treatment is to take a small stick or a match or a toothpick and wind the uh, guinea worm around that stick and slowly pull it out and wind it up. They have to move slowly, otherwise they risk breaking the nematode off. Now, um, these are have an interesting life cycle. 
You get these um, copepods from, um, or the larvae are hosted inside of these copepods and people consume them by drinking contaminated water. These copepods are very, very small. You wouldn't know that you were drinking them, but the larva is inside of the copepod. While you are digesting this guy, um, this guy is being released in your intestines and it can find its way down to the ankle area. It likes to stay in the ankle area and these are going to be the female worms. They are ready to release their eggs. In order to release their eggs, they have to migrate to the feet because people will walk in the water and when they have the water, they will stick out of these blisters and lay their eggs into the water or release their um, young into the water, the larva into the water. Then the copepod eats the larva and then we drink the copepod. So this is the life cycle of that guinea worm. Guinea worms are not the only um, common type of parasite. We also have pinworms, which are common among children, and heartworms, which are very common in this area uh, affecting pets. This is carried by mosquitoes the same way that this one is carried by the copepods. Um, so make sure that you give your pet their heartworm preventative because this is a very terrible way for your animal to pass away. Very sad. Um, so what exactly is a nematode? Remember, a nematode is a tube within a tube. Here you can kind of see that where the outside of the worm is separate from the digestive tract. Here you can see the digestive tract is the dark one. Um, they have several features. They are tapered at both ends, so they look kind of pointed at both ends, but they do have a complete digestive system, which differentiates it from er earlier animals like the flatworms and the jellyfish. So um, they have a complete digestive system and they have a rudimentary nervous system with a head ganglia and uh, some symmetrical nerves running down their body. Um, they don't really have any vascularization or any way to absorb oxygen other than just cutaneous respiration. So they are limited in size just due to the fact that they don't have a circulatory system. What they do have is a thick cuticle or a protective covering around the outside because most of these nematodes are parasitic and they need to be protected from their host digestive enzymes. Um, here we can see uh, the an artist's rendition of a um, nematode. And here again, you see that tube within a tube kind of system. They do have some rudimentary muscularization um, and some a, a nervous system. All right, next is the Annelida or the segmented worm. This includes earthworms, leeches, and feather dusters, an aquatic worm. Um, they are very, very interesting to me because this is the first time that we see a complete digestive system and a closed circulatory system. We don't even see that in crustaceans. A closed circulatory system means that we have blood vessels and blood that travels through those vessels. So the blood is separate from the body fluid. They actually do have five hearts and these branched um, blood vessels that allow to diffuse uh, the diffusion of oxygen. Um, they don't necessarily have lungs. They do still rely on cutaneous uh, diffusion for that. They have a pretty advanced nervous system with a small brain and lots of branched nerves that help it to coordinate movement, find mates, and food. Now, speaking of mates, well, first we can see why they're called segmented worms. Each segment is separated by these septa, these divisions, and this allows them to use their colum, remember their true colomates, as a hydrostatic skeleton and help them to move around. Now, look, I mentioned the mating. These uh, worms are hermaphroditic, mean they have both ovaries and testes in the same animal, but that doesn't mean that they can fertilize themselves. What they do instead is they cross fertilize or exchange copulation. The female organ um, or the oviduct will deposit eggs into this thing called a clitorum or a clitellum, and the clitellum kind of moves down their body and um, when it moves down their body, their opposite um, partner 
can deposit sperm into the clitellum and then the clitellum continues its journey and is dropped off allowing the eggs to be kind of housed in that little clitellum and then grow hatch and grow so very interesting that these hermaphroditic worms can't self-fertilize but they do cross fertilize um, leeches are also segmented worms they are notable because they have jaws um, and some rudimentary teeth with head suckers that allow them to attach to their host. And again, they're parasitic, so they're going to leech off of their host. Next phylum is phylum mollusca. Phylum mollusca is incredibly diverse. Um, this includes the gastropods, gastro meaning stomach and pod meaning foot. These little guys right here are gastropods. Also the bivalves, bi meaning two, um, these are going to be your mussels, clams, and oysters. They have two shells. This is what classifies them as their bivalve. Then we also have cephalopods, cephala meaning head and poda meaning foot. So these are going to be your higher mollusks. The cephalopoda are the squid and octopus and cuttlefish. And some of these can be quite intelligent. Um, looking at one of these gastropods, their notable feature is, of course, their foot. They are entirely a foot. These guys are called foot stomach because their visceral body is pretty much in te uh, taken over by their digestive tract. That starts out with the mouth connected to a radula. The radula is kind of like a really rough tongue that allows it to grind up its food. And you see a radula in both gastropods and bivalves, but cephalopods have developed a beak. They have a beak. Now, the, ra uh, the digestive uh, tract will actually curve around and then deposit right back on its head, which I think is a little interesting. And these guys do have gills and they have to kind of keep their gills moist. So these guys have a lot of um, a mucus that they produce to keep themselves moist. Now, what I really want to talk about is this little green line called the mantle. The mantle is a specific organ that is found in mollusks. The mollusk mantle is an excretory organ. It is going to excrete a calcium carbonate um, uh, sheath which will harden and become the shell. So in these pictures like this, we have the shell here or the shell here. This was excreted by the mantle. That's why you can kind of see that they have layers. All right, looking at the bivalves, you wouldn't think that they also have a foot, but what do you know? They have this big meaty foot. They can actually extend it out of their shell. I used to think that that was a tongue. It's their foot. Um, their digestive system, the mouth opening is opposite of the anus, which is great for them. They also use gills, but since these are marine animals, they don't have to bathe it with liquid. They're already in liquid. They do have um, hearts and circulatory systems, and then they have a well-developed mantle, which will excrete the shell. Now, last, I want to talk about the cephalopods. Cephalopods can be incredibly um, intelligent. These cuttlefish right here, they are very territorial. They can actually change gender, which I think is interesting. Uh, squids here, you can see it changing colors to camouflage with its background. While the octopus or this particular type of octopus called the ringed blue ringed octopus is flashing these bright blue colors, warning predators that it is highly poisonous. Um, so don't pick these up if you see them. Um, and then this is a nautilus and nautilus actually swims backwards by jetting water out of its foot or out of its mouth. In fact, all of these creatures have this foot mouth that has been highly developed to be uh, tentacles and then have like this cone shaped um, opening that they can jet water out of. And they also have a beak underneath these tentacles because their mouth is in the middle of the tentacles. They do have a mantle. You can see here in the Nautilus that the mantle has created this shell, but in the squids, cuttlefish and octopus, the mantle um, is still there, but it creates more of a leathery coating. It does not create a true shell. 
All right, next up is Arthropoda. This is the most diverse group in the entire animal kingdom. It includes over a million unique species, but they all follow some same major rule. Um, the number one thing that classifies them as an arthropod is an exoskeleton, which is made out of chitin. This is the same stuff that we talked about when we talked about mushrooms. They also uh, follow a specific body plan with a head, thorax, and abdomen, and they have jointed appendages and bodies. This allows them to move freely while having that hard exoskeleton. Imagine if you were wearing a suit of armor and it didn't have any joints. You would never be able to move. So armor plating has joints allowing the wearer to move around. Now, I mentioned that this has over a million different unique species. So we're going to talk about the five major subphyla, including trilobites. They're not around anymore, but they are very interesting. They are considered arthropods and they look very similar to modern day horseshoe crabs. Um, but horseshoe crabs are actually pretty closely related to arachnids. Now, when I think of arachnids, I think of spiders like this little guy. But the arachnid subphyla actually includes scorpions, the whip scorpion, um, the tick. I did not know that ticks were arachnids until recently, but they are not insects. They have eight legs and two frontal appendages, which uh, classifies it as an arachnid. Um, then we also have the millipedes and the centipedes or myriapoda. If I have a myriad of legs, then I am going to be a millipede or a centipede. Um, these guys can be, uh, their bite can be very, very painful. So don't pick them up if you see them. Um, then we have crustaceans. These are our oceanic arthropods, including the ones that we like to eat, like crawfish, lobster, crab, shrimp, those kinds of things. But it also includes barnacles, which I originally thought was a mollusk. It's not. It's a crustacean. They're kind of like little hermit crabs living inside of this shell, and they filter feed. They have little claws that they stick out that have fans on them. That's a fan, and they filter feed. It also includes brine shrimp, which are not true shrimp, but they're still true crustaceans. Last but not least is the most diverse of all of the subphyla, um, the insects. The insects are named hexa for six and poda for feet. So they have six legs, one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is such a diverse group. It's kind of almost silly to go over it because I think that I took three graduate courses all over different specific kinds of insects. I took one over um, parasitic insects and I took one over um, uh, aquatic insects. That one was actually really fun, the aquatic insects. And then there's also like beetles, um, butterflies, mosquitoes, uh, lice, ants. These are all different insects, but they all belong in the subphyla Hexapoda. Now, um, they all arthropoda have an open circulatory system or they typically have an open circulatory system, which means that they probably have hearts or multiple pumping organs similar to hearts, but they don't have true blood vessels. These hearts just kind of dump the body fluid into this major body cavity and hopefully pulls it up out of the other side, creating kind of a circular path. And they don't have blood. They're going to circulate some fluid called hemolymph. It's body fluid with um, heme in it, which carries the oxygen. Um, now, they don't necessarily have an advanced respiratory system either, which means they're going to be limited in size. You used to see very large insect skeletons from the past because it's theorized that we had much higher oxygen levels, but today insects are going to be very limited in size. Um, crustaceans that live in the water have true gills, but these um, arachnids here have something called book lungs. They're very similar to gills, but they're a able to absorb oxygen without being bathed in water. So we call them book lungs because they usually are separated by these thick sections and then thin page-like gills. Um, 
Other insects have something called a tracheal system, meaning a series of tubes through their exoskeleton that allow air to kind of circulate through their into their body, um, into air sacs called spiracles. They don't really pump or breathe. They are just absorbing oxygen from the environment. They do have a very advanced nervous system, though. If you notice in all of these different arthropods, their body does not have a lot of innervation because their body is going to mostly be focused on just coordinating movement and reproduction, not a whole lot of nerve endings. But looking at their cephalization, the head has an incredibly advanced and diverse number of sensory organs. Their sensory organs can be very unique and including multiple eyes, compound eyes, antenna, and different types of specialized receptors like chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors. So very cool um, of the arthropods. Their reproduction system is also incredibly diverse, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because, again, this is incredibly varied depending on the specific insect that you're talking about. I wanted to give an honorable mention to mosquitoes because these little guys annoy the heck out of me all year long since we live in southeast Texas. One of the main ways that we can prevent a mosquito overpopulation is by removing standing water from around our house because these guys rely on water to reproduce. They're going to lay their eggs on the water. The larva hatches and is just floating in the water and has almost a little snorkel on top of its head to allow it to breathe then it will pupate in the water and um, kind of emerge from the uh, pupa form as a full-grown adult and flies away. So if you want to get rid of some mosquitoes, get rid of this stage by either treating or getting rid of standing water. Now, there are different types of arthropod growth. Um, there's something called a metabulus. Now, if metabulus means metamorphosis and a means no, then these guys have no metamorphosis. Their juvenile or their uh, nymphs are going to look almost exactly like a smaller version of the adult. What about hemimetabulus? Well, again, if metabulus means metamorphosis, hemi means half. So these are partially metamorphosized. The nymphs all look very similar in these different stages, which they call instars, but then the adult kind of looks a little bit different. So we're going through some metamorphosis. Last but not least, the one that we are very familiar with is called holometabulus, where the metamorphosis is entire or whole, where the larva looks nothing like the pupa, looks nothing like the adult. This is um, our major example is butterflies. All right, um, some of the crustacean um, larvae look very interesting. These are microscopic little guys. Their main obstacle is to not be food for somebody else. In fact, it's a numbers game. We're going to release as many of these guys into the ocean as possible. Generally, it's referred to as zooplankton, and small fish will eat these, gobble these guys up. All right, let's talk about uh, echinodermata. If dermata means skin, echino means spiny skin. This includes the sea urchins, the spiniest of us all, but also sea stars, brittle stars, um, the sea lilies, and sea cucumbers. They all have that feature of spiny skin. Interestingly enough, these guys are also deuterostomes, similar to the chordata deuterostome. Um, deuterostomes, of course, means that the mouth formed second. They do have a complete digestive system. Their mouth is on the oral side, which usually is facing down, and their anus is on the aboral side, the top side, so it can eject its waste from its top. Now, these guys don't have like a super advanced brain or anything, but they do have a rudimentary nervous system and a complete digestive system, which again goes in this side and out this side, but it actually uses the branches of its uh, arms as uh, digestive sacs, digestive glands. Now, Inside of these arms are also the reproductive gonads, which in sea urchins, many people like to eat these. Um, and it also houses their tube feet. 
it can use these two feet um, to move around by pumping uh, fluid into these different um, ampulla and causing it to kind of move and walk around. Besides the tube feet, they also have, um, oh my goodness. <laughs> Besides the tube feet, they can also push fluid through these arms, um, and they are known for their water vascular system. So a water vascular system, they pump seawater in order to absorb oxygen. This is um, one of the more interesting um, phyla of invertebrate. Next, we're going to be talking about vertebrates. We're going to spend most of our time talking about vertebrata. This is a good place to pause and come back later because I know this week is a little bit long. It takes me normally two days to lecture this. So if you want to pause now and come back later, that's great. Just make a note of right now. Um, we are going to go over phylum chordata. Here you can see deuterostomes. If we branch off this way, we get to the echinoderms, uh, which are the sea stars and sea urchins. But we're going to go down here to the chordata. I will make an honorable mention of the, um, uh, the subchordates, but we're going to spend most of our time talking about vertebrata or vertebrates. Now, what classifies an organism as a chordate? Well, it has to have a notochord. This is going to be a, a structure in the back of the organism, and this is going to always be present at least in the larval stage of the animals. In higher order chordates, this will develop into the vertebra bones, not the spinal cord. The spinal cord is going to develop from the hollow nerve cord or the little fold in the skin that I talked about earlier. Um, and like I mentioned, in higher order uh, chordates, this will develop into the spinal cord. Now, all chordates have to have pharyngeal gills. I don't know about you, but I personally do not have gills. So where did these gills go? Well, they are going to be present in the embryonic stage, in the embryonic development. But as these uh, organisms, such as humans, grow larger, the gill slits uh, have evolved into different parts of the skull. So here we see the jaws are pretty much the same. We have our maxillary and our mandible, our jaw bones. But the first gill arch is actually going to become the incus and the malleus, the ossicles of the ear bones, and then some cartilage that is going to help support the jaw. That second gill arch is going to become the stapes, which is also an ossicle for helping with hearing, and it's going to become another link of cartilage. And then the third gill arch is going to become the hyoid bone. This is the only bone in the body that's not attached to any other bone, um, and it sits underneath your tongue. And then we also have a fourth gill arch that will become your uh, collarbone, so it helps to attach your arms. Um, so we're going to come back to this picture pretty often so that we can stay organized. Again, we already talked about deuterostomes. We're not going to talk about echinodermata anymore. Now we are talking about chordates. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the um, lower order chordates, the cephalochordata and urochordata. Now, this is an example of a urochordata. It looks like this. Mm, does not really look like a chordate to me. It looks more like a sea sponge. But during its juvenile stage, it looks like this, in which you do see the dorsal nerve cord and you do see the notochord. You also see a post-anal tail, a complete digestive system, and those pharyngeal gill slits. So its larval stage or its juvenile stage will um, reflect the chordate form, whereas the adults are sessile. And they can be sessile by themselves or they can be colonial as seen in this picture. Let me erase that for you real quick. This is a, a salp. A salps are a type of a colonial tunicate or um, a, these guys, a urochordata and they are going to be uh, hermaphroditic and 
it's it's interesting because the female colonies are going to be the younger ones the ones that are adding on to the end here and the males are older so as they grow older they will actually become males so interesting um, colonial selves now the other type uh not the urochordata we just went over those these are cephalochordata cephalization means the formation of a head so these guys have a head and they are very similar to the urochordate um larva but they retain this body plan into adulthood and they're called lancelets because they look like a lance like a, a sharp knife they bury themselves in the sediment and then they lift these tentacles above the sediment to help absorb nutrients from the water. This is called suspension feeding. This is similar to filter feeding, but they're not picking up food particles. They're more absorbing nutrients that have been suspended in the water. Here we can see the notochord and the hollow nerve cord and the pharyngeal slits. But something else that we have are segmented muscles, and these look very much like uh, fish muscles because they are very similar to fish muscles. All right, speaking of fish muscles, I think you probably know what a fish is. These are going to be aquatic vertebrates. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes, and we're going to talk about a couple of them. They are entirely reliant on their environment for uh, their body, regulating their body temperature, and they do exhibit bilateral symmetry. And they're found all over the world in fresh and salt water. All right, so first, uh, we are talking about vertebrata and we're going to be talking about fish, but these are going to be the jawless fish. Jawless fish are called agnathans, A meaning no, and nath meaning teeth, so no jaws. The hagfish looks kind of like an eel. It does not have scales. It has smooth skin and humans will actually like fish for these guys and irritate them and cause them to release their defense mechanism, which is just to produce a ton of slime. So we use the slime for different purposes to create binders and glues and things. Um, they do have a rudimentary vertebra, but they don't really have a skull or a true vertebra or a true vertebral column. Now, lampreys uh, look very similar to hagfish, but lampreys have all of these hooks and suckers, and they are parasitic. They, you can commonly see them being attached to sharks. All right, speaking of sharks, we're going to talk about sharks next. These are nathostomes. They are jawed fish, but these are called chondrichthys. These are fish that do not have bones. Their skeleton is made entirely of cartilage except for their teeth, which are actually modified placoid scales. Um, these are also super interesting animals. I love sharks. I think that they are perfect. They are unchanged for over 400 million years. They're very similar to their ancient ancestors. And they have this thing called ampullae of Lorenzini, which is unique to sharks, that help them to detect electricity or electromagnetic fields. They also have a lateral line which helps detect movement, but that's not necessarily unique to sharks. Now, chondrichthys means cartilaginous fish. It includes sharks, um, but it also in includes skates and rays. Skates and rays, I used to think were the same thing. Um, the difference between a stingray and a skate is going to mainly be this dorsal fin, whereas the stingray is going to have a dorsal spine. Um, other than that, they look very similar and they are going to lay eggs, whereas some species of sharks lay eggs and other species of sharks actually uh, give live birth. So very interesting, love sharks. All right, we talked about the jawed fish, uh, the nathostomes, and we talked about the cartilaginous fish. Next, let's talk about bony fishes. Actinopterygii are considered ray finned fish. Now, they're considered ray finned fish because of the shape of their fins. Their pectoral fins are organized in a ray and their bony protrusion doesn't really protrude that much outside of their body other than just to control their pectoral fins. Even seahorses have fins, though they're reduced. This includes 
all fish that you think of, including eels. If you think of a fish, it's probably actinopterygii, puffer fish, uh, clownfish, all of these types of fish, including seahorses. They all have gills covered by an operculum, which is a bony plate on, that covers and protects their gills, and they can actually move it in and out to help move water over their gills, as opposed to sharks, which their gills are just kind of exposed, and they rely on movement to filter water through. These guys don't have to move as quickly. They can kind of pump water through. They also have a swim bladder. This helps with buoyancy. Here you can see the bony skeleton. And here on this red fish, you can see the swim bladder has been ejected from its mouth. This is not normal. This fish will die because of it. But the swim bladder, which is normally internal, is a pocket of gas. This is really, really great because if a fish swims down, the pressure on the fish will push that gas into a liquid state, allowing it to be perfectly buoyant at the lower levels. And then as it swims up, the pressure is released, allowing some of that liquid to turn back into a gas. And these liquids are usually pumped in their blood as well, so it kind of diffuses into their body. But when you pull the fish up way too fast, as in this uh, deep sea fishing expedition, the gases do not have time to adjust, the swim bladder doesn't have time to adjust, and so the compressed gas inside of the swim bladder will expand quickly and it will eject outside of its mouth. Now, there's another really interesting type of fish that I want to talk about. It is this guy right here. What a ridiculous looking fish. Um, their fins are so reduced that they're actually really poor swimmers. They don't swim very well. And these are Cygnathidae, the seahorses, sea dragons, and pipefish. Um, they rely mostly on camouflage. You can see this sea dragon right here. Its fins actually look like seaweed, and they kind of sway with the motion of the water hiding inside of the um, seaweed. Their name, Cygnathidae, means that their jaw is together. They have a fused jaw creating this little snout-like. Um, they have a bony casing in their body um, this is a quite a startling picture, but it's modified ribs that have kind of created these rings. So also very interesting. And the other thing that they are known for is something called male pregnancy, but I consider that to be a little bit of a misnomer. What actually happens, if you want to know, you can watch this video up here where you can actually see the deed. The female has a phallus that she will extend to deposit her eggs into the male's pouch. So the male still has the gonads and produces the sperm and he fertilizes the eggs directly into his pouch. The female does have ovaries and is going to produce the eggs. So she just deposits her eggs in that pouch. And then he is protecting or brooding the eggs. He's not actually pregnant. He's brooding. But he does have unique tissues inside of his, uh, inside of his pouch to help these eggs along. They will hatch inside of his pouch in two to three weeks. And then he will eject them from his body. So very interesting. Um, that's why they can release free swimming offspring simulating birth. All right, we talked about actinopterygii. Now let's talk about sarcopterygii. Actinopterygii are ray finned fish, so sarcopterygii are going to be lobe finned fish. They have advanced musculature around their pectoral fins, and they have a bony protrusion that reaches outside of their body. This includes the coelacanth. If you remember us discussing the coelacanth earlier, this is an ancient fish. It also includes lungfish. Now lungfish can actually gulp air and they have rudimentary lungs, not super advanced lungs, but it really helps them to live in muddy, murky, still waters that doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So they can go to the surface and kind of gulp the air into their rudimentary lungs. So this is the first time that we see uh, lungs in sarcopterygii. It's also interesting because this is believed to be kind of the link between bony fish and land animals like amphibians, so tetrapods. 
In fact, we have a tetrapod fossil uh, called the Tetalic fossil. This is the famous fossil that is believed to be the link between a lobed fin fish and a four-legged tetrapod amphibian. That's this guy right here. You can see him attempting to leave the water. He probably was still very attached to the water but could run from predators by just kind of hopping out of the water momentarily. And so this is the Tetalic fossil. That leads us into talking about amphibians. Amphibians primarily are going to have to use cutaneous respiration. They are attached to the water um, because half of their life cycle will be spent aquatic. During half their life cycle, they have gills and they live in the water and they swim and they don't have arms or legs. They still do rely on their skin a lot for cutaneous respiration. Their skin is going to have lots of surface area and moisture to help dissolve um, gases. And their skin is very, very close to their blood vessels, allowing the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Other amphibians will have rudimentary lungs, which are probably more advanced than lungfish, but still not very advanced. This is a salamander lung, and this is a frog lung, and that helps it to increase and absorb um, the oxygen, increase surface area and absorb oxygen. But they still rely on cutaneous respiration, even if they do have lungs. Now, amphibians do not have scales or claws or hair. Um, so that is unique to amphibians. So they have to keep that skin moist um, because it does not lock in any of the moisture and it needs to stay moist to dissolve those oxygens. They're also tied to the water because they have to lay their eggs in water. They do not have a hard shell or an amniotic sac or nutrients. So the egg is um, has to be laid in the water and lots of fish like to eat these eggs. So it's a numbers game. They're just going to lay tons and tons of eggs. The juveniles, known as tadpoles, are going to live in the water, except for the axolotl, which pretty much stays in the juvenile form. And they do rely on their environment for um, uh, their body temperature. Uh, here you can see an example of the aquatic versus the terrestrial life cycle. The eggs are laid in the water. They hatch very um underdeveloped and then they live as aquatic tadpoles until they start to sprout legs then they will move on to land and their little tail will fall off and then the cycle will start all over again here you can see the bony skeleton of an amphibian frog their vertebra is very very short their vertebra is not very long their vertebra probably only goes to about right here and then the rest of this space is taken up by the ilium or the hip bones along with their musculature that allows them to jump really long distances and that's unique to frogs and frogs and toads other types of amphibians like salamanders and newts um, have this kind of body plan and salamanders are going to have those rudimentary like long lungs and also the axolotl is like a salamander but it has those external frill gills and it stays in its juvenile state. There's also something called a Sicilian, which looks a lot like a segmented worm, but it's not. It's actually a legless amphibian. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting, too. That leads us to amniotes. Amniotes do have an amniotic sac, whereas these guys, they don't have an amniotic sac, so their eggs are tied to water. The amniotic sac allows animals to move on to land because now their eggs are independent and their eggs are protected from drying out and usually they have some nutrients in there to help it grow. So also these uh, eggs hatch more developed than the amphibian eggs. Now, the amniotes can be split into three major groups. The synapsids, this is describing the ten, uh, temporal fenestra or the head holes. Synapsids, like mammals, have one fenestra and then their eye sockets. Then you have anapsids. An means no. So these do not have any temporal fenestra. They just have the eye hole. Then diapsid, di means two. So we're going to have two temporal fenestra, and this includes other reptiles uh, that are not turtles. 
So let's look at a couple examples. Here we can see a turtle skull. There's no fenestra. Here we can see what looks like a proto um, mammal, kind of mammalian, but reptilian at the same time. I'm not sure what it is, but it is a synapsid because it uh, has one fenestra right there. And then these are modern. They're not fossilized. This is a chameleon. It has this huge eye socket, but you can see the fenestra here. And there's another fenestra behind it. This is a snake uh, skull. What's interesting about snake skulls is that they can separate and dislocate their jaw. So they don't have a symphysis in the front like other reptiles do. And then you can see its eye socket and then fenestra one and fenestra two. Humans are the synapse. They have one temporal fenestra and our jaw muscles go through that fenestra to help with chewing. All right, so we talked about amniotes. Amniotes include reptiles, birds, mammals, um, and let's talk about reptiles first. Reptiles, their skin is going to have scales, they have claws and teeth. Um, they come in many different shapes and sizes, and they live all over the world except for Arctic climates because they are ectothermic and they rely on their environment. Many of them are going to produce eggs on dry land. Even these sea turtles, they have to return to dry land to lay their eggs. They have like kind of hot, leathery eggs as opposed to birds that have hard eggs. And some can reproduce with parthenogenesis. Now, first, I want to talk about squamata. Squamata is going to be your lizards and snakes. Uh, they are the most diverse group and many of them are venomous and they have really cool adaptations like these bright vibrant colors this um skin flap that it uses to make its body look bigger and even some freaky ones like this horned toad can um, a horned lizard can spray water i'm sorry blood out of its eye by increasing the blood pressure in its eye hopefully stunning its predator and allowing it enough time to get away other things like the chameleon, this is a sped up video of the chameleon changing colors. Now, contrary to popular belief, they do not camouflage with their color changing um, skin. They actually use this to express emotion like um, fear or happiness. Like if they're just happy chilling on a tree eating uh, insects, they're going to be green. But if they feel threatened or alarmed, they might flash the brighter yellow or red colorations. If they're sick, they might become a darker or even black color. Very interesting animals. Uh, super cool. I had one as a pet a long time ago, and it was the coolest animal that I've ever owned. They're not very smart, though. Um, they don't have a big brain for their body size. And sometimes their aim is a little off. So you got to help them eat sometimes. But really cool characters. Next is the testudens or the turtles. They have a ventral shell surface called a plastron that's uh, going to be on the bottom of the turtle. The dorsal shell surface is called the carapace and the carapace is actually formed from modified ribs. Turtles do not have teeth even though other reptiles like squamata do. Um, and remember that a turtle does not live inside of its shell. It is its shell. These are ribs and there's actually a dermal layer on top of the ribs. So here is a picture depicting the evolution of the testudens where you can see these kind of armor plated type um, ribs that have just kind of been exaggerated and exaggerated until they fuse into a plastron. Next is file, uh, the crocodilias. Crocodilia is going to be your crocs, gators, and caimans. Um, this is an example of evolutionary stasis. They're relatively unchanged um, for, you know, 90 million years, which is a lot. Uh, we first see their fossils in the late Cretaceous period, which is the time of the Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and they are the first example that we see of unidirectional airflow. So here we can see the uh, crocodiles, gators, and caimans and their minor differences in body plan. But overall, they look and behave pretty similarly. And this is what I was talking about, unidirectional airflow. That's crazy. Well, humans, they have something called tidal airflow. You and I breathe in 
and out. <sighs> During this process, we are going to have to alternate um, our airflow. Whereas crocodiles, um, similar to other dinosaurs, whether they're breathing in or out, the airflow is going to be going the same direction over their capillaries, over their um, oxygen absorbing tissue. So our oxygen absorbing tissue is inside of our lungs as alveoli. But what they have is they have these air sacs and these air sacs will alternate flowing air over their absorption area. Um, that leads us to talking about dinosaurs um, because some dinosaurs are hypothesized to also have this unidirectional airflow, mainly the avian dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were the dominant vertebrate animal um, up until about 65 million years ago uh, when they went through a mass extinction event. We hypothesize that many of them may have been endothermic, especially the avian dinosaurs. And there is evidence of parental care, which you see also in avians. Um, which means that we think that they're actually very closely related to birds and crocodiles. In fact, we have Archaeopteryx, which is these uh, famous, um, where is it? Where There's the Archaeopteryx. Uh, this famous fossil of a bird-like dinosaur, which led us to the theory that birds are probably evolved dinosaurs. Now let's go back to some of these pictures. Um, I find these pictures to be interesting because sometimes the artist is really, really great at art and not so great at timelines. This one's not that bad. Here you can see a coelacanth, um, a testudin, you can see what looks like a crocodilian, um, and some different types of dinosaurs. Here you even see a cycad tree, which is appropriate for the time. Um, so uh, interesting picture. But what I really want to talk about is this one right here. This one's a little ridiculous. So you do see some nautiluses um, and some other aquatic creatures. You do see these conifers, which are age are appropriate. But what I want you to notice is there's a stegosaurus and a T-Rex, which were alive during the Cretaceous period. And then we have like a Brachiosaurus, which was alive during the Jurassic period. They were not living at the same time period at all. Even though dinosaurs lived all over the world, we can find dinosaur fossils all over the world. It does not mean just because they lived in the same location that they lived in the same time period. So here we have the Brachiosaurus and the Stegosaurus. The Brachiosaurus and the Stegosaurus lived during the Jurassic period. Very likely we could see them in the Jurassic Park and not have a problem. We're all good. But a hundred million years later in the late Cretaceous period is when we see Tyrannosaurus fossils and Triceratops fossils. So if you see a Triceratops next to a Stegosaurus, that is not realistic. They lived about a hundred million years apart. You wouldn't see them in the same play uh, in the same time. Same thing. If you see a T-Rex with a Brachiosaurus or an Apatosaurus, those are not going to live in the same time period. So it's not a realistic representation. So this is a little bit ridiculous because we got the Stegosaurus from the Jurassic period and we got the Brachiosaurus from the Brach uh, Cretaceous period. But then we got these guys that were more likely alive. Uh, I'm sorry, the Brachiosaurus during the Jurassic period and the Stegosaurus during the Jurassic period, but the T-Rex was not alive during the Jurassic period. It wasn't uh, found until later in the late Cretaceous. So Jurassic Park really misled a whole bunch of people into thinking that T-Rexes lived in the Jurassic period when they really lived in the Cretaceous. All right. That leads us to the avian dinosaurs, because as we know, Archaeopteryx is an avian dinosaur fossil. It has feathers. It has a, a rudimentary beak. Um, it has this modified limb that is very wing-like. So we are going to talk next about class Aves. Their skin is going to be covered in feathers, which is um, theorized to be a modified scale, and they do exhibit that unidirectional breathing. 
um, they also exhibit a lot of different modifications and specializations and adaptations for their diet and environment. Um, for instance, these uh, eagles have these large talons to allow them to hunt prey and um, essentially what they use them for is to pierce the skull of their prey. Then we have the pelican here that has a large scooping beak that allows it to scoop up a fish. So they're going to have highly specialized adaptations. Um, one of these uh, specialized adaptations, like I mentioned, is this modified forelimb um, allowed for flight. They have very lightweight bones and many times their bones are hollow. They also have a very large sternum. The sternum is extremely large for their body size, which acts as a place of attachment for their wing muscles. Um, those wing muscles need a large place to attach for those long flights. In chickens, we've actually artificially made that larger because we like the taste of that breast meat. Um, here is an image of those unidirectional um, lungs, and if you want to look, um, this is a GIF that kind of shows that unidirectional breathing. It's going to take four spiration cycles, so inspire, expire, inspire, expire, to go through a complete cycle, and that allows it to use these auxiliary air sacs to constantly keep airflow over their uh, brachii here, okay? Um, so whether they're inhaling or exhaling, there's gonna be unidirectional airflow over their oxygen absorbing cells, their bronchii. Um, these guys are gonna live everywhere on earth, even in the Arctic. Think about those penguins. That means that they have to be endothermic or warm blooded or they wouldn't be able to live in those colder climates. Also, flight is extremely metabolic, me metabolically expensive, meaning it's going to take a lot of energy to maintain flight. So they do have a very high metabolism. Um, and here I like this picture because it shows those lungs and these air sacs associated with the lungs in birds and um, the avian dinosaurs. Last but not least, we're going to go over um, the mammalia or mammals. Uh, what makes mammals unique is their mammary glands. They care for their young and then they excrete milk from mammary glands. Many of them have sweat glands. All of them have hair at least at some point in their life cycle. For instance, whales and dolphins, I don't necessarily think of as being hairy creatures, but they do have uh, some whiskers or some hairs on their face. Sometimes those fall out during adulthood. Um, but you also, uh, these also are endothermic and live everywhere on Earth. Um, except for Antarctica, but not because of the Arctic climate, just because they don't exist there um, for migratory purposes. Now, these animals are going to go through sexual reproduction with internal fertilization, but there's several different methods of fertilization. There's the eutherians. Humans are eutherians. They have internal gestation with the placenta, um, or otherwise, aka a pregnancy. Marsupials also have a very small gestation period, only like a week or two long, and the rest of the gestation is going to happen inside of the marsupial pouch. And then monotremes do not go through gestation at all. They're actually egg-laying mammals, but they do produce milk, which means they are classified as mammals. Um, and another interesting thing about mammals is that you can usually tell what kind of animal they are by their teeth, what they're going to eat, what their diet is like. For instance, humans, we are omnivores, so we are going to have um, molars, canines, and um, incisors that help to cut, crush, and rip food. Whereas a herbivore that eats primarily plants are going to have very scissor-like um, incisors to help cut the grass, but then they're going to mainly focus on these grinding molars. So their premolars and molars look very, very similar, whereas an omnivore, their premolars look very similar to the canines.
Um, strangely, dolphins do not have these specialized teeth. They have what's called homodont teeth, kind of like the crocodilians, um, because they eat fish and they have these cone-shaped teeth that's mainly just for grabbing the fish. They don't chew or anything. They just grab the fish and then swallow the fish whole. Now, let's talk about marsupials compared to eutherians. Again, eutherians are most uh, mammals in the world are going to be true placentals. Marsupials can be found in South America and Australia. It's actually hypothesized that marsupials evolved in South America and then one branch related to this um, Dromiscus mouse here migrated into Australia and then just kind of exploded in Australia. So most um, living marsupials live currently in Australia. There's only one um, marsupial that lives in North America and that is our lovely North American possum. These are super cool guys. You can find them around this area. Um, many people consider them to be pests, but please don't think that way. Uh, these guys are great. They eat smaller actual pests um, and they're marsupial. They actually have a pretty short lifespan, only about five years. And um, they have a really low body temperature, which gives them some resistance to diseases like rabies. So really cool little creatures. But let's talk about these guys. These guys are actually wild. Um, marsupials have really interesting reproduction. Um, so where a marsupial um, is similar to a eutherian is that they both go through conception, implantation, and placental forms. Then they go through birth and lactation. But the the time frame is very different for marsupials and eutherians. Eutherians, like you and I, conception immediately leads into implantation and then a placental stage. This is the pregnancy stage. This happens internally inside of the mother. Then the offspring is born and the um, offspring is reliant on the mother for producing milk, lactation, probably for about the same or longer period than they were in um, the pregnancy. Marsupials, however, they go through conception and then they can kind of choose when they go through um, their pregnancy. This is called stasis. And since they have two uteri, what they can kind of do is one egg will get fertilized and then that uterus will be full and then they can get the other uteri um, impregnated and they can just kind of hang out there until they give birth. Um, so implantation happens almost immediately, but then we have this period of stasis. Then they will have a very, very short placental pregnancy inside of the uterus, usually only lasting a few weeks. Then the birth occurs through a modified median uh, birth canal. Um, I'll talk about the branched birth canal in a second. Um, but once they are birthed through this central birth canal, they are birthed directly into the pouch and they go through several different lactation stages. The offspring is uh, very underdeveloped and it kind of crawls until it latches on to a teat and it almost fuses with the teat during this primary lactation stage. Um, so this is very, very similar to the placentation stage in eutherians. Then they go through another lactation stage where maybe they're uh, able to release from the teat, but they still stay inside the pouch. And then the last lactation stage is very similar to the eutherian lactation stage where the joey is allowed to go in and out of the pouch and drink milk as it freely wants to. This is nutrient, ind uh, nutrient independence. Now let's talk about this wild reproductive system. The reason why marsupials have a branched vaginal canal is because their ureters from their bladder or from their um, kidneys to their bladder actually flow through their reproductive system. Whereas in eutherians, the reproductive and the uh, urinary system are completely separate. So they have a single vaginal opening and a single uterus. Whereas marsupials have a two part um, 
uteri. Um, they have a single urogenital opening, which um, also has uh, feces also comes out of that, but they have three vaginal canals. These two vaginal canals can be used for fertilization. Many marsupial males have a two-headed um, penis that allows them to fertilize either uteri at a time. Some of them even kind of alternate. It's, it's wild. You can look more into it. It's not necessary for this course, but I just think it's interesting. Um, and then that central vaginal canal is there only during uh, the female's adulthood just to give birth into her pouch. So this actually does not connect to the urogenital sinus. It will connect to the pouch. Super, super interesting animals. And I also used to think that the pouch was kind of fuzzy and comfy inside, but it's not. It's just like skin. So I guess it's comfy for the joey because that's what they're uh, used to and it's warm because it's next to their mother um, but it's skin and here you can see the teat the teats are very long and it, it fuses with the joey's mouth this is actually a more mature joey it's probably in the second to third lactation stage we also have monotremes monotremes are egg laying um, mammals and they are considered mammals, again, because they have mammary glands. And this includes only the echidna and the platypus. They're both found in Australia. And the echidna is a little bit different than the platypus. The echidna actually has a pouch and will lay her eggs directly into her own pouch, similar to how the marsupials uh, give birth directly into their pouch. But the platypus does not have a pouch. The platypus is unique uh, in that it has a bill and the males have venom they have venom uh males have a venom barb in their ankle now it was recently discovered that the platypi actually is fluorescent it can glow green under a fluorescent light or a black light which makes this guy make a lot more sense i was wondering why the artist chose bright teal but this is actually what the platypus looks like under uv light um, here is uh, an example of this venom barb on the male spine, and here is an example of the echidna's pouch. These are the teats, and that is the uh, central vaginal opening that can allow it to give birth directly into that pouch. And these are their small leathery eggs. Their legs, eggs are small and leathery, kind of like turtle eggs. Last but not least, let's talk about primates. Primates can be found um, in all of the tropical zones in the world. Let's see, we've got the new world monkeys, chimpanzees, old world monkeys, and the apes. Well, chimpanzees and gorillas are part of the ape family. Um, these guys are incredibly diverse. The prosimians are the lemurs and bush babies. Lemurs are primarily found in Madagascar. Um, apes do not have a tail and they actually spend most of their time on the ground as opposed to in the uh, tree branches and they are considered to be more intelligent but that's because we're here and we are narcissistic and we love ourselves so we named ourselves the super smart animals. Um, that's what homo sapien means, sapien means smart. Um, our closest living relative is the chimpanzee, but that does not mean that we have evolved from chimpanzees. It's more like chimpanzees evolved from a similar origin that we did. Um, last is the New World monkeys. Let's look at some examples here. Um, this baboon has these crazy canine teeth, which just tells me that I do not want to uh, speak to that animal. They are very aggressive and territorial, and they will um, attack. Um, then the old world monkeys can be found all in these tropical zones of Asia and Africa, including the Persimians in Madagascar. New world monkeys are mainly found in South America, and this includes your marmosets, your spider monkeys, and your squirrel monkeys. Now, uh, these um, primates are going to have adaptations for grasping and climbing trees. So their feet have these opposable appendages like thumbs, except for humans, we have evolved to walk upright. So our feet are purely for walking, not for grasping or swinging from vines like these guys. 
they not only have strong grasping feet and hands, but they also have tails that help them to grasp and climb and maintain balance. And these adaptations will differ depending on their mode of um, movement. So um, do they walk on all fours? Do they swing from branches or do they leap? All right, that is it for today. Thank you for joining me. If you want to know more, you can do some virtual dissections. I have an earthworm, a cat, a frog, um, and a beetle, and also a starfish. The starfish one is uh, pretty interesting. You can look at different types of organisms um, that are dissected. And don't forget to do your chapter laboratory write-up this week. Um, the lab quiz is open note, so make sure that you complete the lab write-up. The chapter homework is optional as always, and don't forget the 5.4 chapter quiz, which is closed note. Also coming up is the unit five exam due next week. So make sure that you complete the unit five exam. The lecture exam is always closed notes. You are not allowed to use any aids or notes in the lecture exam, but the lab exam is open notes. So you're welcome to use your lab write-ups during that exam. I hope that y'all have a great week. Um, thank you for joining me today and I will see you for unit